In this lesson, we're going to be looking at different relationships and how abuse, particularly emotional abuse, is expressed in these relationships. Uh, so we're looking at husband, wife and parent. So we've already looked at this in a previous lecture. Um, so that'll just be less um, thorough in my description of it because you've, we've already looked at it in a previous lesson. So when when we're looking at a um, uh, husband that emotionally abuses his wife, we've already looked at verbal abuse, uh, that's overt and covert. So overt verbal abuse is uh, things like threats, insults, uh, uh, really clear ways of speaking that are harmful to the victim. And then covert is more hidden, so that could be the tone of voice, jokes that are made to d diminish the victim, calling her names, things like that. Question and threats, threats that are made about things that she's dependent on, such as finances, uh, health care, minimising, denying and blaming, so minimising her, th her thoughts, her, uh, her feelings, Achievements, denying that he's said or done things he's clearly said or done. Blaming, it's her fault. And remember, abusive people are entitled. So he'll blame her for whatever's gone on. Intimidate, so that could be up, up front, making her scared, like up front in her face, blocking her way, reckless ways of driving that we spoke about, mind games, so crazy making. Relating to her in ways that she doubts her ability to think and, and make decisions and therefore goes to him to be able to understand life. Isolating from other people, friends, family, church, male privilege. So when a husband abuses his wife, the male privilege that's abused would be headship, a sinful distortion of what the Bible teaches about that. Probably also greater physical strength as well. Financial control. So not giving enough money to, to look after herself and the children, perhaps taking away access to money, using the children, so either abusing them or turning them against her, having two personalities, so at in the home being an ogre, horrible person and outside being seen as kind and caring and spiritual, jealous, he, oh, he's entitled, so life is about me, and if she gets more attention than him or other people give her attention or she gets her attention to other people or achieves something that he doesn't have, he gets jealous. And then importantly, good periods where um, they behave well for a length of time. And this can remind the victim of the person that she fell in love with and she starts being vulnerable and opens up again, invests in a relationship. And then when he reverts back to being abusive, She's even more distraught than she was before. It just compounds the awfulness of the abuse. So that's a typical description of um, when a husband abuses, emotionally abuses his wife. Now let's look at some of the effects, common effects that happen if if the wife goes along with this. And now, as I said in the beginning of this course, these are, this is not a list of guaranteed things that happen. These are th pa things that keep coming back. So this is not a set in stone list. There, there, there could be more to other things as well. So common effects are confusion. So remember I said that a lot of the things are mind games. Uh, she's confused. She'll be thinking about what did I do that caused him to treat me this way? And she's trying to figure this out because she doesn't want to be abuse. She's trying to figure out how not to be abused in the future. But the things are too confusing. You can't, you can't make sense. And that's because she's not responsible for the way that he treated her. Um, but she's confused by it all. And this leads to her doubting. Doubting her ability to understand, her ability to think, her ability to make decisions, uh, her ability to go through life. And then she'll start reverting to him to fill in what it is, uh, how to understand things. Uh, when talking about doubt, I remember being with someone who'd been in a relationship like this for many decades. And she was, an incident had happened and she was in hospital and her husband was not there at the time, at the incident. So when I visited her hospital, the husband was there and she was sharing with me what had happened. 
And he said, no, that's not happened. This is what happened. But he had not been there. But because she'd been in that kind of relationship for so long, she accepted his version of the story, even though she wasn't there, he wasn't there at the time. So what I'm saying is the confusion, the doubt, and then they go to the abuser in order to understand things correctly. Which isn't correctly, it's becoming it's coming under control of the abusive person. Fear. They'll start fearing, what's he going to be like when he comes home? Uh, how's he going to treat me? What happens if he carries out any of the threats that he said that he would carry out? She'll be living in guilt. Remember, blame. It's a huge part of, of abusive behaviour. And if she accepts the blame, she'll feel guilty. Um, it's, it's her fault. She's to blame. It's her fault for what's going on in, in the relationship, for the way that he's treating her. And she'll be living with this guilt. Which and it's a, a responsibility and a guilt and a blame for something that's actually the abuser's responsibility. Worry. Very similar to fear. Going over in her mind, what's he going to be like when he comes home? And worry is you start thinking about imaginary scenarios. What if? And then you build on this imaginary scenario and start, you, a lot of people start uh, acting based on what they've been thinking about as a f possible future thing. Um, and it's perfectly understandable because of the way that they've been treated. If he's threatened her, it's a scary place to be. What's going to happen if I can't feed my kids? Are my children going to turn out like this? What will happen if I displease them? I might be treated in a certain way or I could lose my friends. It's very understandable that people worry. Inhibition. If they're, if they're in a relationship like this and they're being, they know that a certain way that they behave could set off a tirade of emotional abuse, they'll be on eggshells because they'll know that they need to be careful how they behave. So they could be always looking out for the person's reactions, the abuser's reactions, their, their facial expressions. So they can become inhibited because they're trying to prevent being abused in the future. So someone that in the past has been very jovial, full of life, could be withdrawn. A, a completely different person because they're scared of being treated in this way. In a group setting, they might be scared to share their opinion, whereas in the past they might have openly shared it. Or if there's a, a social setting, they might not say anything, they're withdrawn, they're inhibited because they're scared of future abuse, or they might even believe what's been told, what's been said to them by the abuser, that they're stupid, that they're less than other people, that um, they don't add up, that they're, that they're annoying, that everyone doesn't like them, that something wrong with them. They could have studied to believe that and therefore not communicate and become inhibited in who they are. Anger. Um, they'll be angry at themselves for marrying the person, angry at other people for not intervening, not being able to help. Um, anger at the husband for the way that he's treating her. A sense of shame. I'm not good enough. There's something wrong with me, inherently more wrong with me than other people, such I do not deserve to be loved, that this is the way I should be treated. The changed mental state. Just what I was saying earlier on about when I was speaking about doubt, their mindset has changed. They, they, they're not thinking clearly as they did in the past. They become dependent on the abuser, and this is where um, secular people talk about brain fog, where they're not able to concentrate. The mind wanders. They start uh, being preoccupied with other things. They're not themselves anymore, uh, and. When someone's in this place, it's visible. Um, you can see that they've changed as well. This is another reason when some people would think, well, why don't they just leave them, for example. If, if someone is in this place of mentally being dependent on someone else, this, to, to leave someone is a scary place because they need the other person to make decisions and do the thinking for them. So they become emotionally, behaviorally, and mentally dependent on the abuser, just like I said. So they, uh, over a period of time, they've come to this position of living to please the abuser, 
and trying and, and come to a place of dependence and, and the thinking having to have the abuser do the thinking for them so, so they're, they're completely in all aspects of who they are dependent on the abuser which is extremely harmful to them as a human being and if you live like this I said in the very beginning of this course our God has made us phys with a physical aspect and an immaterial aspect and that's intertwined and if you live like this for any length of time it will affect you physically so uh, the headaches stomach problems high blood pressure just some of the many physical ailments that people who are in emotionally abusive relationships suffer from loneliness and loneliness because if you marry someone you don't marry to be treated that way so you're lonely because of the lack of relationship in your marriage and also the uh, loneliness of the lack of people who understand your situation um, it could be loneliness of relationship as well if, if you, you as a couple are not included in other relationships like other people are you struggle with depression very understandably I, I've known a lot of people who've, who've come to that point of just giving up if you live in anger fear guilt shame for a, a, a long period of time it usually leads to depression yeah. there are physical reasons for depression as well but I'm talking specifically in this you and you can give up the sorrow is the last one the sorrow of your situation you the marriage that you're in and if you live in that sorrow for for a length of time it can lead to depression of um giving up on life very understandable there's some the the the, the pain of the of the emotional difficulty of being in this kind of relationship these are all ways that and as we grow in wisdom and the lord all these th things i've listed to it you we can help them in a compassionate way th through our lord and through scripture and through as a church as a community uh, it's possible uh, to, to, but uh, as I say, coming from a, a place of understanding and care and compassion. What about when it's a wife that abuses a husband? This is very common. It's less spoken of, but it's very common. So the wife abuses the system. So as well as what I've listed as typical uh, descriptions of abuse, the wife will abuse a system which is usually geared in her favour. So uh, um, a lot of systems nowadays as opposed to the past are now more uh, to the advantage of the wife and the mother and they'll abuse the system so maybe false accusations of abuse um, in order to abuse the system they could isolate their uh, husband from their friends just like we talked about isolation being a, a, a typical aspect of abuse so they'll isolate them from their friends and that could be through false accusations of brothers or um, co-workers being interested in them or or the husband being interested in them it could be that uh, falsely saying that the mother-in-law has always been against them things like that work relationships where there's an like, accusation that people the women at the worker are interested in him there's been situations of abusive wives coming and bringing the children to the workplace making the husband look after the children at the workplace using the children again that's a, uh, that is included in abuse so using the children turning against the dad they might um, it, if there's a separation they might accuse a second partner of being better than dad things like that harassment so uh, harassing them on by using of um, mobile phones cell phones uh, stalking them on internet social media and so the technology been situations forcing to look at pornography financial control and the effects the if a man has been abused a, a lot there's understanding of manhood masculinity it makes it hard for men to speak up and say that they're being abused um, so the effects of abuse the self-doubt uh, doubting their ability to think because of the mind gains and gaslighting anxiety fear and panic attacks depression sorrow helplessness no, a total inability to do anything about the situation stress 
isolation, self-harm. Um, they seem afraid of or anxious to please a partner. They go along with everything that their partner says and does. Checks in often with a partner to report where he is and what he's doing. Just that level of control, making sure the partner is happy with them. Convinced he's going mad or losing his mind. That Again, that goes back to the gaslighting. The crazy making techniques. Very low view of himself, even if he's a confident person in the past. Shows major personality changes. Like I said, it happens in abuse. Going from being an outgoing person to becoming withdrawn. Depressed, anxious, suicidal. My increased drink or drug use. You know, people have to do something with their emotions. And if if you if someone doesn't know what I do with this or get get the right kind of help, usually they'll do something to 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 try and deal with these emotions, and that could be drink, drugs. Some people look at things like pornography, social media, exercise. Something to make them feel better. It's not deal addressing the, the the problem, it's not addressing the heart, it's not addressing the issue, but it's understandably something that's helping them feel better about the situation. Get problems sleeping and have nightmares. Spend long hours in the workplace. And maybe not take their periods seriously. They they don't look after their own hygiene. And they look unwell. Like that's perhaps due to lack of sleep. And they can start thinking about committing suicide. I think it'd be better if I wasn't here. And maybe even try and commit suicide. So what about a parent when there's a parent that's abusive towards a child? So they could go th they could call the child derogatory names, ridicule, scold, blame, humiliate, verbally attack or belittle the child. They could have an ongoing pattern of negativity or hostility toward them. For example, not talking to them or giving them hateful looks. They make excessive and inappropriate demands of the child and exposes the child to extreme or unpredictable caregiver behaviours. That could be, for example, looking at pornography or something like that. They could use fear, intimidation, threats, bullying to discipline the child or press the child to keep secrets. Um, demonstrate a pattern of boundary violations, excessive monitoring or over control that's inappropriate considering the child's age. I, m I remember a few years ago meeting with someone, a, an adult, an 18 year old, whose mother had to know absolutely everywhere she was and had to get permission. And this was like 7 30 at night. And my mother had to control absolutely everything. Expects the child to assume an inappropriate level of responsibility or places them in role reversal when they're meeting the emotional needs of the parent, or emotional desires of the parent, and then um, maybe inappropriately being made to look after their younger siblings undermines the child's significant relationships so i've seen this where the child will make friends and then the parent will go and tell the friends bad things about the, their their child or mock them and therefore the the child keeps losing their friends not allow the child to engage in age appropriate socialization so how do parents go about being abusive so they, these are the, um, patterns that secular people have recognised. So these are things that keep coming back. Admiration, the parent wants to be admired. That's the attitude of life. They want to be admired, listened to, agreed with. And if people don't admire them, they revert to fear. And they'll make them fearful. So you better admire them. And this is where the secular world talks about narcissistic rage. They get madly angry. And if fear doesn't work, they'll they'll play the victim and try and get people to to feel sorry for them. So ang admiration, fear, and pity. Then vindictiveness. If the pity doesn't work, then there's a price to pay. They'll become vindictive and start a smear campaign. So admiration, fear, pity, vindictiveness. And another three three Ds: drama. If they're challenged or criticized, they'll react in a drama dramatic way. Denial. If the drama drama doesn't work, then they'll deny what they, deny what they're being challenged about. So what you saw and you're imagining things that you're daydreaming, and then deflect. So denial and drama. If these don't work, they'll deflect. So instead of dealing with the issue they want to be discussed, they'll you know then deflect onto the the person that's doing the chat that's trying to raise the issue, and it becomes about that person's issues and faults instead of the issue that's being raised. So drama, denial, and deflection. 
Another well-known uh, term is DARVO. That's a secular term that describes abu uh, abusive behavior for deny, attack, reverse, victim and offender. So they'll deny whatever they're being accused of, start attacking, or maybe accused of, deny whatever's being discussed. They'll start attacking the person that's uh, trying to raise the issue. And then in the process, reverse victim and offender. So the offender then, the abuser then, becomes a victim. And the person who's trying to raise the issue becomes the offender. So the effects on the behavior. Um, someone who's raised in a home like this could be engaging under or overperforming, be fearful in relationships, relate to others in order to win love and approval. That's coming from never being loved and approved at home. So they, they become part of who you are when you're growing up. And then become, because it's part of who you are, you tend to relate to people that way. Self-harm, addiction. So I, um, again, some people want to, need to do something with their emotion. So then they engage in self-harm and addiction as a way of trying to ease the, what they're going through. Could become passive, just not doing anything, not bothering. And it has an impact on the thinking, their ability to concentrate. And that's um, part of abuse in all areas. Where, um, it affects our minds. So the difficulty concentrating and intrusive thoughts and when you get and thoughts that keep bombarding in your thinking um, and just keep coming, keep coming. So it's extremely important to work on this and to be thinking of things that are helpful in life giving and truthful. And it involves a lot of work because the more you go along with intrusive thoughts, the, the worse it is for you. Disengaged thinking or dissociation where you switch off, where you're, you're out of the situation. It has an impact on relating to other people. So boundaries, they don't know how to say no in appropriate ways to people. So people can walk all over them or have inappropriate uh, involvement in their lives. Uh, one of the things that uh, secular people have talked about is ob observe, not absorb, is to... Instead of, when, when people are, are treating others in an abusive way, they, they don't like people being able to think and make choices. It's all about the emotion of the situation because then they can control. So it's important to take a step back from it, not to be emotionally caught up in it. And, and the secular researchers have talked about observe, not absorb. So you're taking a step back in your mind and observing what's going on you're not getting absorbed in the whole situation observing okay what's being said and what's being done and then being able to reflect on how how should i respond to this in a way that's of the lord people pleasing you um uh, i how can i make sure that you're happy with me because if I, you're not happy with me then you might reject me or harm me Responsible for other people's emotions. Uh, they were raised to be responsible for the parents' emotions. And now they feel that they, they've grown up with that. That they then t carry that over into other relationships as well. Now when, we, when we're raised, our parent, we, when we are children, we believe our parents are right. And they, they teach us right from wrong. They're example to us. And we emulate them and we absorb things from them. So it's likely that someone who's raised in a home like that will also have aspects of their character that's just like their parent. So they could feel entitled or not let other people have a different viewpoint or um, get angry if people don't do what they want, things like that. Um, isolation, withdrawal from relationships with other people. The impact on emotions of being sensitive to others' emotions. You're aware of how other people respond. You can read other people really clearly uh, in ways that are more, are, are sharper than most people. You fear and worry. We talked about that in other abusive relationships. Fear of what someone's going to do. Worry is a future scenario. What's going to happen? An imaginary scenario in the future. So these two are connected. What is the person going to do? What's going to happen if uh, if they do whatever? Uh, how am I going to be treated? How What's going to happen to other people? So I hope you found that helpful. Um, husband, wife and um, parent.